My name is Quantum Wei. I'm a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering at MIT. Um, we have a rock star panel here. Um, we're going to start with a couple of short introductions. Uh, we want to keep those pretty short because we want to reserve most of the time for discussion and interaction between the panelists. Um, so then we'll get into a discussion. Um, and then about halfway through the panel, we'll start to open that up to questions from the audience. Um, I'll have a couple um, members from the team walking around with microphones to so just raise your hand, and I'll walk over um, and take your questions. Uh, but I'll hand it over to Nancy. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Nancy Lobby. Um, I'm with the World Wildlife Fund and work on sustainable food and sustainable ranching. And I'm not probably your typical environmentalist in that I've spent the majority of my career in the beef industry, in the beef sector, understanding how beef is produced from literally pasture to plate. And I think in that role, I have a unique perspective in kind of this whole idea of the water footprint, as well as other uh, environmental um, impacts of, of meat production. So as I said, um, the life cycle of beef from from literally pasture to plate really starts um, with the pasture. And in the US, and I'll speak specifically on beef and, and specifically on the US and Canada, the way beef is produced in this country is literally the majority of the time is spent on pasture with the last uh, 200 days or so spent in a confined feeding operation fed a variety of, of feedstuffs. So the environmental impacts, specifically the water impacts on, uh, of beef production, literally lie, as Dr. Briggs had mentioned, in the feed part of, um, of the life cycle of the animal. Although they do spend quite a bit of time on pasture, I wish it was just as, as easy that they could, we could just um, feed cattle grass all the time. But it's not that easy, it's, and it's not that simple. If it was, we'd already have those. Um, uh, have that problem figured out. Um, there are trade-offs to everything that we do. So, and I think Dr. Briggs mentioned in his talk about the uh, fact that we are going to have a growing population, 10 billion by 2050, depending on who you listen to. And because of that, the way we produce food in general over the next 70 years is going to be very, very important where and when we produce food and how we produce food is going to be one of the, the big uh, challenges of the next generation. And so with that, I think um, one of the things that WWF looks at is not only, is not really from the consumption part of that, but as an organization that looks at uh, the production side. And so we were one of the founders of the US Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, where not only conservation organizations, but retailers, processors, uh, others within the beef sector all got together and said, beef production is not going away. We can all stop eating meat if we want, but we're still going to produce beef in this country. So if we can work on the production side of things, we will have a much bigger um, impact. And so we, that organization is about three years old and really looking at identifying the solutions on the production side of things. And then one of the other issues that we work on at WWF, if you wonder why in the world WWF is interested in food, um, it's one of the biggest threats to some of the areas that we really care about. And you'll see on this slide um, one of the areas that's right here in our backyard. It's one of the last four remaining intact temperate grasslands in the world. It's called the Northern Great Plains. It's outlined in yellow there. The map is really the Great Plains. And um, th this is a map taken from uh, something we call the plow print, which that little small piece of Northern Great Plains is, is still intact and is still grass. And the reason that it's still grass is because it's managed by ranchers for cattle production. So in our, in our um, one of the things that we really look at is how can we work with those ranchers? And we're talking about very large ranches, 5,000, 10,000 acres at a time, where we can, if we can keep those guys on the, the landscape and keep them ranching, keep them producing cattle as part of the solution, improve the way that they produce cattle, 
then we have grass for all of the species that we care about. This landscape is just as important as the Amazon, as the Arctic, as the Great Barrier Reef. And we're not deforesting it, um, but we are plowing it up for crop agriculture. And so we, want, we are trying to maintain one of the last great uh, places uh, for, for everyone and for all the, the wildlife that depend on it. Great. David. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is David Cantor. I'm a professor of environmental studies at New York University. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the MIT Water Club for hosting us. Um, my work in general focuses on and the big question, which I guess we're all interested in, which is how can we possibly feed 10 billion people by the middle of this century without completely screwing up the planet at the same time? Um, and with that in mind, my research really focuses on <clears throat> nitrogen pollution uh, and food security and sustainable development and kind of how those meet, uh, no pun intended, in a, in a nexus. But um, the focus today is on meat production and we uh, have a pretty complicated relationship with meat. I also apologize, I don't have a slide, I've gone old school today and even have handwritten notes, so <laughs> forgive me. But um, we have a complicated relationship with animals. Um, on the one hand, and I'm sure I, I wasn't here, unfortunately, for the first day, but, and I'm sure this point has been made in several other places, but meat is a uh, really important source of calories and key nutrients to a lot of people. Right? We still have 800 million people on this planet that go to bed hungry every day. We still have 200 million children under the age of five that are stunted, which hinders their intellectual and physical development. Uh, one even more crazy statistic is that one out of every two pregnant women in the developing world are anemic due to lack of iron, right? Um, so meat is crucial for many people in terms of a source of nutrients. But at the same time, and as Dr. Briggs pointed out, um, it is livestock production is one of the biggest pressures on, on our natural resources and one of the biggest contributors to pretty much every pollution problem that we're facing today. Um, I won't go over what Dr. Briggs talked about, but just in terms of the amount of water that's consumed and where it's consumed, yes, obviously the, the feed that's produced to feed those animals, uh, the amount of water that's needed in terms of the, um, when, you, when they go into industrial feeding operations and to keep those operations hygienic, the slaughterhouses, the tanneries, all of those places need a massive amount of water. And if you account for all of them, the, the, the latest statistics, at least that I've seen, is that um, over half of the water that we consume is linked to livestock production in some way. So that's the use part, right? But then there's also the pollution part, which also impacts the amount of total fresh water that we can actually use. Um, so obviously um, linked to what I do Livestock production is a massive source of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, which comes from the inefficient use of fertilizer and manure, and that contributes to a whole range of environmental problems, right? From a water perspective, um, it can lead to eutrophication, dead zones, massive algae blooms, right? Um, at the end of the, the figure that Nancy was showing is the Gulf of Mexico, right? The Mississippi River Basin, which drains into the Gulf of Mexico and the dead zone last year in the Gulf of Mexico was about the size of Connecticut, okay? Um, that leads to not only ecosystem damage, but also economic damage in the form of fish kills that impacts fishermen livelihoods. It also impacts our ability to actually enjoy those places. It also impacts drink, drinking water quality. So there's the whole nutrient pollution part of this. There's also pathogens, right? Really important bacteria like E. coli, salmonella can be waterborne and transported that way. Uh, there was, Dr. Briggs talked about um, uh, the various antibiotics that get into uh, water systems and can endure, right? About half of the antibiotics that are consumed in this country don't go to us, they go to livestock, right? And those endure in the environment. Um, so it's a big 
pollution problem. Now, policy can be effective. I want to kind of just finish this by talking a bit about some policy experiences. Because, for example, in the European Union, you can hear that I'm not from this country. I grew up in the capital of, of Europe, in, in Brussels. And in the European Union, one of the most important environmental policies is known as the nitrates directive, which tries to reduce the amount of nitrate uh, that goes into our water supply. And it's been pretty effective. It's reduced the amount of nitrate pollution by 15%. Um, and also a raft of other nitrogen compounds like ammonia and nitrous oxide. But the problem here, and this is the kind of point that I want to get across on the policy side, is that unless we take an integrated approach to how we deal with uh, particularly problems, environmental problems that come from agriculture, we can, it can be a bit of a whack-a-mole exercise. So for example, in Denmark, which has one of the biggest livestock production uh, areas in Europe, one of the strategies that they used to reduce the water pollution from meat production was instead of leaving manure out on the fields in the winter, they would store them in these storage facilities, which was great. It reduced the amount of nitrogen runoff, uh, but it increased the amount of ammonia emissions. Now, ammonia is a really important component of air pollution, contributes to particulate matter uh, concentrations. And so you were solving one problem while exacerbating another. Right? Um, and this leads to the fact, the, the point that livestock production isn't just a meat problem, it's also a climate change problem, it's a biodiversity problem, it's a land use change problem, it's a desertification problem, and all those are interlinked. So climate change is obviously going to exacerbate uh, water scarcity. Um, so already the amount of contribution that livestock is making to the amount of water that's consumed is gonna, that pressure is going to be felt even more. Um, and policy is hard, right? The agricultural lobby is one of the most powerful lobbies we have in our society. It's also generally, uh, obviously, we have industrial feedlots, but a lot of agricultural pollution and, and the pollution that comes from livestock production is diffuse. Uh, so it's, it's a, not a point source. It's very hard to monitor and enforce. Um, so I'll end with what can be done. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. Um, we do need, at some level, a better integration of how, where we, how we produce our crops and how we produce our animals. Those have become more disparate over time, more concentrated in different parts of the country. Uh, we can get into this more in the discussion, but just um, how we manage our manure, questions around pricing water, and obviously on the consumer side, as Dr. Briggs was talking about, reducing meat consumption. And this is all underlain by the fact that in many countries, uh, meat consumption and simply owning livestock, right, is also really important cultural and social capital. So understanding the cultural context in which this is operating, right, and, and the various layers is really important and a really tricky, really interesting for academics like me and really tricky for policymakers to figure out. So I'm happy to be here and happy to be part of this discussion. Awesome. Thanks, David. Bill. All right. Uh, yes, I'm Bill Gill. I'm with uh, Smithfield Foods. Uh, we're the largest producer and processor of pork in the world. Uh, so what that means is we raise more hogs and process more hogs into the finished product uh, than any other company. Um, we, um, we have operations mainly in the United States. Um, uh, a little bit of activity in Poland and Romania, a couple joint ventures in, in Mexico. Um, uh, what we, we own and operate, um, we own and operate 500 hog farms and then we contract with 2,100 other farms. Uh, together they produce about 16 million hogs a year. Uh, in the United States we have about 45 plants, another 20 kind of scattered out in Poland and Romania. Um, Together, they process about 30,000 uh, hogs a year. Um, so uh, we have um, almost 50,000 employees, um, uh, about 15 billion in sales. Um, all that to sort of put us uh, a little bit in context. Um, and that means, of course, we're a big company. Um, so we have big impacts, but I think we also have big opportunities. Uh, in terms of, of how we can impact the kind of things that are being talked about today and throughout this, uh, this summit. Um, the way that we try to, I guess, manage our sustainability and our, our impacts on the environment are, are through what we call our core values or our sustainability pillars. 
And um, as you can see from the slide and the titles, it obviously makes a lot of sense for a company like Smithfield Foods. Um, of course, animal care is very important to us. Uh, this is uh, the, the procedures and methods that we use to, to raise and to treat our animals, uh, how we manage things like antibiotics and um, uh, open pen gestation, which is, is how we treat pregnant sows. Um, so, so we have obviously an extensive program there focused on efficiency uh, and, and proper animal care. Um, uh, environment is for us kind of water, waste, energy, and I guess greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so, so we work under a, uh, an international standard, ISO 14001, which provides a standard for companies to use to address environmental management. Uh, we also have, of course, goals associated with our, our use of resources. Um, in fact, we recently announced uh, a goal, not necessarily specifically water related, but uh, we're going to endeavor to reduce our carbon emissions by 25% by 2025. So that's, that's uh, a big part of how we, we drive ourselves in terms of environment. Um, obviously, we're a food company. Food safety and quality is very important. Uh, we use uh, uh, the global uh, uh, food interna or safety international standard. Uh, so we have, a, a, an, again, another standard that we adhere to and we audit to or are audited to in terms of food safety and, and quality. So that's how we try to provide, of course, safe food. Um, uh, we, we do things there like, for instance, we recently uh, provided on our website a, um, an ingredient glossary. So if you look at the back of a package of one of our products and wonder what does this do, why is this in this product, you can go to our website and look at the glossary and it will provide a, a bit of an explanation of why that particular uh, ingredient is, is in the food that you're eating. Uh, people is, of course, our employees. I mentioned nearly 50,000. A lot of this is our safety programs that are, are mainly OSHA driven, um, but we also have uh, uh, programs uh, on safety behavior. We have one like called Raise Your Hand. If you see something, we want you to raise your hand, let us know. Uh, if it's unsafe, if it's affecting the quality of our product, if it's affecting the environment, let somebody know and we can address it. Of course, we have scholarships and trainings uh, groups like Team Smithfield, Women's Connect, uh, that we use to, to try to make our facilities a, the kind of place that people want to work in. Um, and of course, helping communities would be uh, the philanthropy um, uh, in terms of charitable donations. Uh, we make obviously a lot of food donations uh, as well as monetary donations. Um, each of our plants is involved in programs like community cleanups. Uh, we work with volunteer fire departments on things like pork chop sales and, and whatnot. Um, and so we, we want to integrate ourselves into the, the communities uh, where we operate. We find that to be very important. Uh, that gives us um, our license to operate and, and, and helps the communities understand that we are part of the communities. Uh, no longer do we just say, well, look, we hire a lot of people and we pay a lot of taxes, so you need to leave us alone. It's no, we, we, we understand that we have that social responsibility, and so we try to address that. Um, and the way we, we look at all these things, we are a for-profit business, but we, we, we try to look at, at the overall value. So when we, we do something, we, of course, have to look at the bottom line. We have uh, plenty of accountants in our company that track those kind of things. But at the same time, we say, well, what, what's, what's the value? What, what other entities or resources uh, or what other impacts are being created? And, and can we kind of look at this in terms of overall value? Uh, in a lot of cases, it's very difficult to, to assign a, a specific value, a dollar value. Um, but, but these intangibles are, are something that we really try to consider as a company. Um, because it typically benefits us overall in terms of, again, our employees, our animals, our food, uh, our customers, and, and the stakeholders that are involved with our company. So, again, we're a big company, big opportunities, big challenges, um, and big impacts um, that we can make in positive and, and potentially even negative ways. So, thank you. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. My name is Eliza Roberts. Can everybody hear me in the back? People always say that I talk too softly. Okay, if at any point you can't hear, just. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you, MIT Water Club. It's really great to be here. Um, I had a long trek from uh, Downtown Crossing this morning, where I work at Ceres, 
which is an, a sustainability nonprofit that's based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, there are actually a bunch of job openings right now, so if any of you are on the, the job hunt, you should check out our website. Um, but a series uh, overall, we, we, our, our vision is to create a sustainable global economy, and we do that in a few different ways, ultimately partnering with companies and investors. And at the core of what we're trying to do is building the business case for why sustainability challenges are real risks for these companies and pose real risks to a company's current and future profitability. Um, we're not just gonna tell a company you should be doing this because it's the right thing to do. No, you should be addressing water challenges because there are real risks for you now, now and in the future. Um, so there are a few different programs that we run at Ceres. We have a corporate network where we work with companies from a range of different sectors to help them understand sustainability risks and then incorporate those risks into their long-term thinking. And we also have an investor network that's made up of some 115 or so uh, institutional investors worth some 17 trillion in collective assets. And we work with those investors, which include some of the largest asset managers in the world, some of the largest pension funds in North America, and a number of different socially responsible and religious investors, we work with them to educate them about sustainability risks from water to climate change to deforestation um, and make sure that they're really integrating that into their thinking and their buy-sell decision-making. Um, so, and we also have a policy angle that uh, some people are sometimes less familiar with. It's called BICEP, Businesses for Innovative Climate and Energy Policy. You know, our perspective here is that, you know, Ceres can come to the table with other groups and say, this is a really important policy challenge. We think you, as a policymaker, should respond to it. But if we can leverage these brands and, and help draft a letter that then companies sign on to, then that can have a lot more power. Um, and so we've been doing that a lot at the federal level at, at, the, at the global scale as well. When it comes to climate change, a number of colleagues right now who are in Bonn, um, and then also a lot more at the state level given the current political climate. Um, so that's just a series in a nutshell. And then in terms of what I do, I lead our agricultural water risk program at Ceres. Ultimately, we are working with the world's largest food sector companies, including Smithfield, um, working with them to you know, understand sustainability challenges and uh, move forward on their sustainability journey, but focus specifically on water. So helping these companies to develop commitments, um, leverage the power that they have over their supply chain to then help to protect freshwater resources all over the world. Uh, we do end up having more of a US lens, however. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole lot more I could say about all of that, but I'll just say, you know, two quick things I want you guys to know about in terms of our work on agricultural water risk. Uh, we just released uh, an, an analysis called Feeding Ourselves Thirsty that you can check out, feedingourselvesthirsty.series.org. Um, and in that analysis, we rank how the largest food sector companies are responding to water challenges across their operations, governance, and their value chain, and score them from zero to 100 points. I think I'll talk a bit more about some of the findings from that in a bit, so I won't go more into it there, but I think um, it's, a, it's a good place to go if you wanna get a sense of you know, how food sector companies are responding to these challenges and which industries are further along than others. Um, and then, you know, we're, I don't think we're gonna go that much into the investor piece here, but I just did wanna say that I think the investor role in all of this is a really interesting one, and something that a lot of people aren't thinking a whole lot about um, you know, investors are much more focused on water than they ever, ever have been. You know, I think climate change is something that a lot of investors have woken up to in the past, you know, five, 10 years. But water is increasingly a focus. Uh, we have an investor water hub where investors are coming together to work with Ceres to develop tools for other investors to help them understand how they can evaluate and, and respond to water challenges. Um, that group started with eight investors. Now it's made up of 100. It's grown basically eightfold in the past year. Um, so much more interest. A lot of the service providers that do re provide research and tools for investors are providing you know, more research and analyses on these topics. The Bloomberg Terminal has collecting a lot more water data. Um, and then you know, there's a stat, McKinsey just recently put out a report that one in five dollars that's managed today has some sort of environmental or social governance ESG screen linked to it. So you know, this is just gonna continue to grow and I think it's just an interesting trend to, to be aware of as you guys move forward in this space. Um, and last but not least, I just wanna say that um, I really love talking about the role of companies because I think sometimes, particularly in this political climate, we can all feel very frustrated um, about what's going on and, and feeling like there are certain policy levers that you can't move forward. But I think there's a lot of opportunity, as, as Bill said, a lot that companies can be doing and they don't necessarily need regulations to incentivize them to take those actions. And so I hope that you guys leave with a, a glimpse of hope here that there, there are actions that can be taken. And I think there's a lot of potential also in this room. So being able to step away from my computer and sit in front of all of you, you guys are ultimately among the people who will be helping to address and solve these challenges. So 
um, thank you for listening and for, for all that you're doing. Awesome. Thank you, Eliza. Uh, so, Nancy, uh, I know you and I have spoken a lot about uh, all the different situations you see on ranches and how, because of that, um, technology um, has to be applied carefully. There's not going to be any one-size-fits-all solution. So I was hoping maybe you could dive in and explain to the audience a little bit more about all the factors that lead to different ranching situations. Sure, absolutely. And I think that it's just good to know that the way we produce beef across this country and globally is different. It's different the way we produce beef in Montana than the way we produce it in Florida. There's different soil types. There's different rainfall. There's uh, different plants. There's a whole variety of things that are different. There's different, spe you know, different kinds of cattle that we use in the South than we don't that we, we would use in places like Montana or Nebraska. So the idea that there is a, there is just one solution that's going to apply to all of these different um, production systems is is just uh, it's a pipe dream. It, it just doesn't work that way unfortunately. Um, so I think one of the things that we look at as, um, as a conservation organization is how can we empower the folks that are on the ground to make decisions and to produce better? So the role of technology is a, is a big one in that, that there are definitely um, technologies that are out there that folks can use that will help them make management decisions, whether it's um, grazing apps or um, the use of, of certain feedstuffs and those sorts of things. So we think it's a really um, important lever that can be used in order to not only reduce the water footprint, but also the carbon footprint and the other um, uh, environmental factors that come when you produce uh, beef. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Uh, and David, I know that you've done some work with the Uruguayan government looking at their beef production systems and maybe looking outside of the US. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, sure. So I was working with the Uruguayan Ministry of Agriculture where a couple of years ago when they were trying to develop a strategy for their beef sector to put it in line with the newly agreed to sustainable development goals. I uh, don't know if they, they, these goals that were agreed to by the United Nations from ending hunger and poverty to trying to deal with climate change, protecting water, improving education, gender equality. Um, Uruguay is a really interesting country. It's about the size of North Carolina, uh, 3 million people and 12 million cows. Uh, and for such a small country, they have 5% of the world's beef exports. And the way that they like, they, is a really interesting uh, case because um, they market themselves as kind of the whole foods of beef in the sense their whole mantra is Uruguay natural. It's all about grass fed, um, you know, hormone free, incredibly well tracked. Every single cow is tracked in a database so they can control disease outbreaks and everything. So on the one hand, the reason that they can sell their beef at a premium, the reason that they can market it as whole, the whole foods of beef is because of a lot of these kind of health and green labeling of it. Um, on the other hand, they obviously want to increase the productivity. They want to increase the economic value of that sector. How can they do that in a way that's consistent with uh, the sustainable development goals? And so we worked with them to set both productivity targets for their sector, but also to set targets for nitrogen losses, water use, uh, greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of meat. Um, what was also interesting, and we did that not only with their Ministry of Agriculture, but also with agricultural researchers in different regions of the country that are in direct contract, work directly with farmers, so that there was a level of credibility there, that it wasn't just you know, some researcher from a university in the United States dropping in and saying, hey, guys, I, I have all the answers for you. Don't worry. And I have a British accent. We, we're pretty good at neo-colonial, you know, things and telling you what to do. Um, no, it came from the people that understood the land, that understood, that had solid relationships with farmers, which was really important. Um, but it also highlighted uh, some of the challenges associated with dealing with this sector, right, that Uruguay has the highest beef consumption per capita rates in the world, 75 kilos of beef 
per person per year. That's a kilo and a half of steak a week. And it's really good steak. I understand why they eat a lot of it. But um, it's, it's a huge amount of beef. But they, you know, when, I, when you broach with the Ministry of Agriculture people um, about initiatives, educational outreach, about potentially educating people on the risks of consuming, over consuming that much red meat and, uh, and all that, they, they laugh in your face, right? Because they, it is more than just um, a question of nutrition in this regard, right? It's a question of culture. Uh, and it's, it's in the lifeblood of that country, right? Um, and so uh, dealing with both, there's the academic and the kind of policy side of things. And then you're also dealing with these underlying cultural and social aspects that are sometimes more difficult uh, to address. So that was a, it was an interesting experience. Great. I think, um, I mean, one thing we heard yesterday over and over again, and Nancy and David have both touched on this, uh, but all of these issues are very dependent on the context. Again, there's not going to be any one size fits all solution. Um, you really have to look locally what's going on, um, what you want to do. Um, Bill, I know uh, Dr. Briggs talked about uh, feed conversion efficiencies. Um, I know you wanted to explore that a little bit more. All right, sure. Um, feed conversion, uh, simply enough, is uh, you know how much grain, how much feed it takes to make a certain amount of pork, of, of hog. Um, uh, probably 15, 20 years ago, it took about four pounds of grain feed uh, to make one pound of hog. Um, so we operated with that ratio. Um, of course, uh, it makes sense to us as a company to be as efficient as we can in terms of, of feed conversion. So we've looked, of course, at diet uh, and, and breeding genetics and uh, how the animals are treated, uh, additives, all, all kinds of, of possibilities in terms of improving feed efficiency. And over the last about 15 years, we've gone from, from a four to one ratio to now we're at about 2.4 to one. So that's uh, essentially a 40% a improvement in how efficient the hogs are in, in taking feed and creating meat. So, um, uh, you know, from our perspective, that's very good. But I think as a company, we're really just starting to realize even the broader impact of that. Um, everything involved is essentially proportional. So if we use 40% less feed, uh, that's 40% less fertilizer, 40% less water uh, to, to grow the grain, 40% um, less grain that has to be transported somehow. Um, of course, 40% uh, less that we, we have to handle. Um, uh, of course, with the hogs more efficient, there's uh, a benefit on the other end in that there's 40% less in manure, essentially, for us to, uh, to deal with. So uh, we, we kind of, I think, initially viewed feed conversion as, you know, the, the less feed and the more hog, the better. But we're really starting to see the broader implications of what that does. Um, we're, we're working, it, it's kind of difficult to quantify. My 40% is, is an estimate and kind of proportional in terms of the impacts all along sort of the value chain for, for pork production. Um, and we continue to look at that and try to drive that number uh, lower and lower. But, um, uh, you know, if you, th you think about, um, I, I don't know, automobiles and a 40% increase kind of in gas mileage and the impact that has on fuel use and, and carbon emissions and things like that, um, you can see, like I said, 16 million hogs uh, being fed with this large reduction in what it takes uh, to, to generate that feed, to process that feed, and then even the, the part that's not consumed by the hog and how much of that we have to address. Even some of our diets, uh, of course, the hogs want nutrients. That's what helps them grow. So even the waste that they generate, the manure, has less nutrients uh, than it would previously. So uh, a, a big company like ours, like I said, if you start to extrapolate and multiply things out, uh, you see a really huge and significant impact, I think, from from, from something that kind of seems, uh, I guess, maybe as natural and simple as let's make our hogs more efficient. Let's give them a better diet so that they can utilize the feed better, uh, generate less waste product, and more essentially saleable product for us. Great. Um, I'm curious, Bill, 
getting down from four to 2.4, was there one particular adjustment that accounted for a large portion of that? Or, or was it just a lot of hard work, a lot of different changes? I think it's very, it was very incremental. Uh, obviously, we're very careful with what we, we feed our hogs. We don't want to generate uh, unintended consequences somehow in terms of the quality or the, the flavor of the meat or, or, or long-term impacts on, on the hogs. So we, we move very slowly and very carefully. Um, you don't want 16 million hogs that aren't edible anymore. Um, so uh, like I said, it's been very incremental. Probably the, probably the most significant thing we did to contribute to that effort was really that we realized that we needed you know, dietitians and um, the expertise to go along with that. Um, probably nobody in this room remembers trichinosis. Right, that's because people used to feed hogs kind of garbage and leftovers and whatnot. Well, uh, you know that's been eliminated essentially by our industry, um, but not in, not necessarily as an effort to maybe eliminate trichinosis, but to um, to provide a better diet for hogs and get better feed efficiency and get better grow out of the animals. So I think the the expertise that we've brought has really been the, the game changer for us, understanding that this is significant to what we do, uh, not only financially, but in, environmentally and, and from a sustainability perspective. And so, uh, you know, we, we have dietitians. We're uh, experimenting with diets and working with select groups of hogs, uh, certain genetics and breeding uh, to create all this. So we, we move slowly and carefully and, and a little bit at a time. And I think, uh, you know, from 4 to 2.4, like, kind of like anything, you start out in the low-hanging fruit and some of the stuff is easier. So our, our curve is probably starting to flatten out a bit. But I, I, we feel like there's still room for continued improvement. And, and we'll continue to pursue that with, with the expertise uh, that we need to be able to accomplish it. Awesome. Great. Um, and Eliza, uh, sort of hoping that you could share some of the findings from that report. What are, broadly, what's the meat industry um, doing well um, to handle their water impact? And sort of what are some next steps that you think they could go in? OK, great. So, so Feeding Ourselves Thirsty released about a month ago. Uh, again, we ranked the largest food sector companies on how they're responding to water challenges across their operations and value chain. We looked at four industries, so that included packaged food, beverage, uh, agricultural products, so the big grain traders, and then meat companies. Um, and we did this. This was our second analysis. The first one was done two years ago, so we were able to really see what sort of improvement has been made in all of these different industries and the sector overall. So overall, there was a 10% improvement, um, but that's really looking at many different companies from all of these different industries. There's a range in performance from, so out of 100 points, there were a few companies that got one or zero points, and the leader got 82 points. So we set a very high bar. There's room for all companies across the board to improve. And I think with water, you know, the way that different companies need to improve really varies depending on what industry that company is, how their business is structured, um, and what, you know, where they're sourcing from and where, it's all about the context really, as Quantum was saying. Um, so in terms of how you know, the meat sector, the meat industry performed within that analysis, the average score across the board for the whole food sector was about 33 points out of 100. Packaged food and beverage were definitely the leaders. There were about seven companies that got over 50 points in packaged food. Um, but then you know, a number of companies are much lower than that. Within the meat industry, the average score is 15 out of 100 points compared to the 33 out of 100 for the average overall. So a lot of room for improvement. We looked at six different meat companies. So it included Smithfield, it included JBS, Pilgrim's Pride, Purdue, um, I'm missing one or two others, but um, oh, Tyson and Hormel. Um, and in terms of what they're doing well, I mean, I think there are a few examples of what meat companies are doing well. I think Smithfield is a really strong example. They're the top performer. They got 33 points. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of really great stuff that they're doing and, and a lot of great stuff that I know that they have on the horizon. Um, but I think one of the really great examples of what Smithfield is doing that's really helping to lead the industry overall is their fertilizer optimization work that I imagine Bill will talk a little bit about. Um, but ultimately, you know, we know that feed is the biggest piece of the pie in terms of water impacts. And so you know, I'll let Bill talk more about this, because I'm sure he can explain it better than I can. Um, but it's ultimately a goal to um, 
optimize fertilizer application on grain sourcing regions. It's now southeast and midwest, right? 75% right. um, enrolled in this program. Um, and ultimately, they're engaging with farmers and getting them to reduce the amount of fertilizer that they're applying, um, excess, the excess of which would just run off into local waterways. Um, it's a really specific goal, and um, it really is very directly linked to the impact. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of farmers have quite a lot of pressure on them these days. And so opportunities for big companies like Smithfield to set goals like that and to work with those companies on the ground to support them and help them understand the business case for action that, you know, big buyers like Walmart want them to change uh, is really important. And then also providing financial incentives as well. So I think Smithfield's offering like a, a loan to use some sort of technology that then helps with the fertilizer optimization. And, and that's, a, you know, we're definitely seeing some companies doing more of this, but not, you know, this is unprecedented in the meat industry. Um, Hormel has set a sustainable ag policy, a sustainable agriculture policy. Um, you know, you could say, okay, what's a policy? Ultimately, um, there is a lot of power in putting a policy out there that says, this is what our vision of sustainable agriculture is. This is how we want all of our suppliers, including um, contract, uh, Grow, contract growers and feed suppliers to operate. Um, this is what we want them to do. These are our expectations of them. Um, and so that policy is now live, and so that's a really great thing to see, and we hope that other meat companies will follow suit. Um, and then, you know, we've seen other meat companies become more engaged in field to market, um, and then, you know, becoming more engaged in the roundtable on sustainable beef that I'm sure Nancy will talk more about. Um, but, you know, those are a few examples, but at the end of the day, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement and a lot that the meat industry and the agricultural products industry and really the food sector overall really needs to focus on. So um, if I were to say, if you remember, you know, three key things that the meat industry really needs to do moving forward, the first is to understand their exposure to water challenges, where they're sourcing, where they're sourcing feed, um, where their animal operations are located, um, understand where the hotspots are, both in terms of water quantity and quality, and then use that to make decisions about how they should be operating moving forward. Uh, and the reality is that a lot of companies haven't actually done a water risk assessment. They don't understand what their risks are. They may know in their direct operations and within their own four walls, but many have not gone outside their four walls to understand what's going on in their agricultural supply chain. Um, so across the food sector, 45% of companies have not done a risk assessment of their agricultural supply chain. Um, and then within the meat sector, it's five out of six companies have not even begun to evaluate the risks that they're exposed to in their ag supply chain. So one is understanding your exposure to water risks. Um, the second is developing policies and codes that guide how your suppliers, um, feed suppliers, contract growers, you know, everybody in between is operating, what your expectations are for them, um, and using that to really, like leveraging the power that you have over your value chain to have an impact and, and impact the way growers are, are managing things at the field level. And then the third piece is taking action um, at the field level. So it's setting you know, goals, a sustainable sourcing goal, for example, like what Smithfield has set. Um, but sustainable source, you know, a lot of companies have stepped up and set a sustainable sourcing goal to source you know, X percent of their major commodities sustainably by a certain year. But really, it's getting a lot more granular than that. And it's making it so that it's much more linked to the impact, um, reducing the water that you're pulling out of aquifers in these high-risk regions, um, optimizing the fertilizer that you're applying to fields in these high-risk regions, um, getting really granular there, and then engaging with farmers at the field level, providing educational and financial support. So understand your exposure, policies and codes, and setting goals and taking action in the agricultural supply chain. That was a long answer. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So if you take a look at the report, um, and you mentioned this, uh, you'll find that the meat companies um, as a whole, uh, Smithfield had the highest score, 33. But the agricultural companies, I think the highest score I saw was a 49. Um, this is in contrast to the beverage companies and the packaged food companies, you're seeing higher scores, 70s, 80s. Um, so I'm wondering, what's the reason for the discrepancy in scores? Is that due to? like food and bev companies being closer to the consumer, maybe there's more pressure on that side, or is it because the meat and ag companies are facing different sorts of challenges when it comes to sustainability? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's one that we get a lot. And I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of it really is linked to the consumer pressure. And I think it's also that consumers, when they think about water use, the first thing that they think about is you know, water in a beverage, right? because you can see it. But the hidden water footprint in meat, in, in grain, is something that a lot of people are not as familiar with and is much more complicated to understand um, if you haven't really spent a whole lot of time thinking about water, which many haven't. 
Um, so I think a lot of it is the consumer pressure. Um, and I think beverage and packaged food companies overall have gotten a lot more criticism and pressure on the sustainability front overall. So they've had to be more of the first movers, particularly you know, the big brands like General Mills and Coca-Cola, um, PepsiCo. You know, they're really in the limelight on these issues. And so they've had to respond a lot more. Um, so I think that's one of the big reasons. And then, of course, there's, there is an interesting dynamic where the packaged food and beverage companies are buying a lot of food from the meat companies and the agricultural products companies. Um, we didn't rank scores, uh, rank companies like Walmart and the big retailers, but you know when Walmart has a fertilizer initiative, which they do have, then it drives many of their suppliers to take action and to focus more on those issues. Um, so there's a really interesting dynamic there where when the beverage and packaged food companies start to step up, then it does create a little bit more incentive and more of a business case, I think, for meat and, and the big grain traders to step up and start responding to that. Um, but I think that meat companies like Smithfield recognize that consumers care more about these issues and that millennials in particular are much more focused on where their, where their meat comes from and what the quality of their food is. Um, and so any company that doesn't start, step up and start to focus on these issues is going to, I think, is going to really suffer in the long term. So. Great. Um, so switching gears for a moment, um, I mean, you talked about the awareness of the hidden water footprint of meat and sort of a lack of awareness um, on that front, although I think it's not a problem with this audience. Um, a large portion of that water footprint is due to what we're using to feed these animals. So I'd like to take a moment, uh, give everyone a chance to talk about um, what do you see are the challenges and opportunities to try and either reduce the water footprint, the water usage, um, there, or also looking at the pollution question, uh, fertilizer optimization. Um, yeah. So I, I think one of the things to, um, from, from the production side, especially in beef, sometimes we're not talking about reducing. It's, in some cases, it's great to reduce. But in some cases, reducing your water usage isn't the best. We still want cattle to, to drink water. Um, we still want uh, we we want them water to keep them cool when it's uh, when it's needed. And so, at WWF, we don't talk about reducing as much as optimizing that water use to make sure that we have are using everything in our in our power to um, the water that we do use that we we manage it the best way possible. Um, some of the things that we're looking at at WWF on the production side of things is. Are there ways for us to improve the genetics of those animals? And I think one of the things that we see from a production side is that, although um, Dr. Briggs talked about three years of the lifespan of, of a typical beef animal, in the US it's more like two. Like from the time that it's born to the time that it turns into beef, it's usually about a two year lifespan. So anything that you do genetics wise takes two years before you see the impact on the other end. Um, in the meat. And so some of the things that we're looking at it are, can we use genetics to improve how that animal not only utilizes feed, but utilizes water and utilizes all of the, the um, things that it needs to grow and to, and to be more efficient, um, potentially gaining faster on grass so that it spends less time in the confined feeding operation. And we actually have a study going on right now where we're looking at those sorts of, um, sorts of factors in, in the, on the production side. In the Northern Great Plains, something that we look at, um, and it's, it's quite challenging in that everybody, um, as I mentioned before, we produce beef differently. And even in the Northern Great Plains, where it's a you know, very vast uh, native grassland typically, um, we're talking about big ranches, somewhere between you know, 5,000 to some as big as uh, half a million acres, um, variety of different soil types, variety of different rainfalls. And so the way that that land is managed is really critical in how it will receive the rainfall that it gets. This, this land is not fertilized, um, typically. Uh, we, we don't, there, although there are center pivots out there that do sprinkle some of that for, for hayland, for the, the most part, this is wide open grass spaces that only takes things that fall from the sky when it comes to water. So um, the way that that land is managed is going to impact how um, that land 
uh, takes on water in, and it infiltrates into the soil. Uh, as many of you may know, up in um, Montana this year, they suffered just a, a horrific drought. It was um, one of the worst in, in the history in Montana. Um, we worked with some ranchers up there. Uh, in October of last year, they actually had uh, massive amounts of rain. And it, um, some areas flooded, and it ran off. But these ranchers in this area that had, they really focused on managing their grazing and managing how they're, they're working on that landscape actually did not have to reduce their uh, cattle herds because of the drought, because the soil just absorbed all of that water in that October rainfall. And it held that water and produced the grass. And it was a very resilient system that actually still produced enough um, feed for the cattle for them to, to keep that uh, their, their herds maintained um, through the drought. So I think it's a definitely drought and those sorts of things are going to be a challenge for those producers going forward um, with climate change. But the way that they manage is going to be also really, really critical. That was a really long answer, but I hope I've answered your question. Great answer. Uh, any other? Yeah, I can speak to the, to the nutrient side of things on, on the feed production aspect. Um, so uh, about Globally, about half of the nutrients that are applied to cropland are lost to the environment in a variety of forms. Um, and obviously, a lot of that cropland is devoted to feed production. And so the, the kind of overarching solution to that is that you want to better synchronize when nutrients are in the soil with when plants actually need it. And um, there are a lot of really interesting and exciting initiatives in that regard. Um, th there are kind of two main ways that you can improve nitrogen use or nutrient use efficiency. One is through better um, best management practices. So um, there's really cool GPS technology, for example, that allows farmers to see where exactly in their field uh, needs more nitrogen than, than others so they can be more precise in their application of fertilizers. They can also split up their application over the course of the growing season instead of applying it all at once. Um, then there are also really interesting technologies. For example, um, fertilizers that are polymer coated. And that polymer coating dissolves over the course of the growing season and is a result of uh, a function of temperature and moisture in the soil. So delays the release of the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potash. Again, better synchronizing when nitrogen is in the soil and when plants actually need it. Um, the problem that I think policymakers, and particularly in this country, face too is that um, even though, for example, the funding for programs to incentivize the adoption of best management practices has increased pretty dramatically under the Obama administration, um, the actual adoption of these best management practices at a federal level has stayed pretty stagnant. So, and this has already been touched upon, um, but expanding beyond policies or policy initiatives that try to change farmer behavior and look at other actors in the supply chain that can have perhaps a more uh, important influence on farmer behavior. So looking at these sustainable agriculture supply codes, looking at one project that I'm focused on, for example, is uh, one of the most successful environmental policies in this country is are the CAFE standards, right? the automobile efficiency standards, where instead of government telling the 120 million drivers in this country, you should probably limit your driving to 1,000 miles a year. No, they just regulated the six car companies and forced them to comply with certain fuel efficiency standards. Right? There is an analogy here with the fertilizer industry. Instead of trying to regulate the hundreds of millions, the, not the, sorry, the millions of farmers in this country, but the hundreds of millions of acres of farmland, focus on the six fertilizer companies that control 85% of the market. And, um, increase, mandate and increase proportion of the amount of enhanced deficiency fertilizer that's actually sold as part of their overall commodity. So those are, I think it's time to kind of expand the, the policy focus, which has traditionally been focused on farmer behavior and try to look at the entire supply chain, which we're already touching on here. Any other thoughts? You don't have to. Yeah, I, I can add to that. I don't. Um... I'll jump in later. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, I think the the fertile. I think enrolling um, more acres in these programs where data is being collected is really the key. Um, and David was hitting on that. I'm, I'm really glad you brought up fertilizer companies because I was in a pa the panel yesterday on water quality, and I wanted to ask that as a question. But I think 
um, you know, their business model ultimately is like the more fertilizer they sell, the more money they make. So what's the incentive, right? And they're providing a lot of the educational support to farmers. Um, but anyway, that's an aside. But I think enrolling more farmers in platforms where data is being collected on a number of different metrics. So Allison from Field to Market spoke yesterday. Um, more programs like Field to Market. There's a program called Sustain. Um, that's really key because right now we just don't even have the data. And without the data, then you, you don't know if there's been improvement. Um, and so these, these platforms are really key. And, and they're, a lot of them are being referred to as continuous improvement platforms. And I think the more that we can get uh, the big companies that source from these farmers to set goals and expectations that the growers that supply to them need to provide them with data and improve over time. Um, and maybe they set a specific goal for, you know, that's linked to the local context. So if there's an, a hypox, a goal in a specific, um, like in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, there are these specific hypoxia targets, right? So if you could link that to, you know, what farmers are allowed to release um, and there's, you know, data collection that goes along with it, I think that could go a really long way. Uh, I think the policy levers are really important, but I think right now I just don't really see a whole lot of potential for driving a lot of those forward. But I think um, companies working with growers to change their practices really does have a lot of potential right now. And I think the other key is, is the money and financing it. And that's a big challenge. A lot of companies don't want to pay for it. There's the fear that if you, you know, spend money on this or you offer a premium to growers and they change their practices, then those growers will just go to one of your competitors. Um, but I think the more that we can get companies to step up and help fund this, and not just providing premiums, but also um, providing more creative types of financing. So for example, you know, you're a farmer, I, you know, I will source, we can uh, extend the contract that we have for three years instead of two if you provide me with data and demonstrate improvement. And if you don't demonstrate improvement, then you're not gonna be uh, one of our uh, growers anymore, or maybe you just, you know, you won't be a priority one moving forward. Uh, so there are lots of other creative ways, but I think seeing companies do that and then also companies working together in watersheds that are really at risk to help pool funding, cost share. There's a lot of interesting stuff like that going on, and I think we need to see a lot more of that moving forward. Bill? No. Well, uh, Smithfield, of course, is a large purchaser of grain, um, and, and we buy grain by the train load, not just train car, but train load. Uh, and so we don't go to individual farmers and say, how much for your, your corn? We go to large companies, obviously like Cargill and, and others who consolidate uh, from farmers and, and pull that together so we can buy in the quantity. So, you know, we go to Cargill and say, how much for a million tons of corn? We can't do that with individual farmers. And so there's several layers between us and the farmers. So it's, it's a challenge is how, how do we reach out to farmers? How can we interact with them uh, to, to help them be more efficient? Um, part of what we do as, at our hog farms um, is, of course, the, the manure is flushed out from under the barns. It goes through anaerobic digestion. Uh, and then that kind of breaks it down. So it's a fairly nutrient rich water stream, uh, which has been indicated can be potentially a problem. But of course we use that to grow crops. Uh, we do that under certain regulations and requirements and permits. So we have uh, agronomists on staff and we have equipment so that we can make sure that we, we maximize the uptake of nitrogen. We're not allowed runoff things like that, so we're, we're focused uh, on doing that. Now, we don't raise a lot of crops uh, relative to how much uh, corn and feed that we need, uh, but, but we, we do have expertise on staff. And so, uh, Eliza mentioned a, a program, uh, rather than go to farmers and say, give us this data so we can help you, um, we go to farmers and say, look, we have some ways we think uh, th that we can help you. And we're working with uh, another NGO, Environmental Defense, to try to reach out to these farmers. And we set a goal uh, that we wanted 75% of our grain to come from farms that engaged in a program we call it Smithfield Grow. Um, so we <coughs> reach out uh, to these farmers uh, through this program. Uh, and what we do is, is we can afford certain technologies uh, like, like David mentioned, that, that help not only determine how much nitrogen a crop needs, but what parts of a field need certain amounts of nitrogen, what the soil quality is, what the nitrogen uptake of the crops are. Um, 
So we work with farms, uh, but essentially for free, uh, with, with our agronomists and our, our folks, and through environmental defense to, to provide information on how they can be efficient and also technologies uh, that can help them analyze the, the nitrogen in their soil, the nitrogen uptake of their crops, um, how much water they really need and when that water ought to be applied. A lot of the techniques that David talked about, uh, we, we try to, to pass those on to, um, to farmers, and, and of course, uh, even though not directly they're our grain supplier, the benefit, of course, for farmers is, is increased yield, um, you know, more with, with less, uh, and so that's, that's of interest to, to farmers. And, and uh, farmers are, are, are real good about, uh, if, if something works, it, the word spreads fast, or if something's a problem, the word spreads fast. And so our hope is that uh, through this program that you know a farmer will tell a farmer who will tell a farmer, and we'll get more participation. So uh, th this goal of 75% of our, our grain, uh, right now we have um, about 380,000 acres engaged um, in this program which I think is about 75% of our 75% goal. I think we're looking at like a uh, half a million, 500,000 acres to be included in this program. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of times farmers are generational on the same farm, you know, and, and this is how my dad did it, and this is how his dad did it, and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, but at the same time, a lot of farmers are realizing that increased yields uh, with less fertilizer and, and less inputs to their system um, are, are profitable, more profitable for them. So we, we, we try to work with them. Like I said, the, uh, rather than go to farmers and say, give us this information so we can tell you how to make your farm better, we're kind of, uh, obviously everybody's more open to here's some free information and some free help if you would like to use it to make your farm better. And I think the word is spreading. And so uh, we're, we're picking out acres pretty rapidly. We'll, I think our goal is by 2018, we'll surely uh, exceed that by the end of the year. Um, so it's a very good, good program. Uh, we, we work, we, we don't want or run off, we don't want ex excess nitrogen. Farmers don't want to do that either, but they're a little bit unsure. And of course, you know, if a little do a little, then right, even more nitrogen is better. I get better yields, I get more corn. Uh, but at the same time, they can go to excess and then create runoff and, and groundwater and, and surface water issues. So we, we try to sort of provide something uh, that draws farmers in and be able to use because we're, we're just not able to reach out to them on a one by one by one basis uh, and even know who supplies our, our corn. So we, we offer the program and it's not necessarily only for our suppliers, uh, but, but the connection is there and there's a lot of interest. So we're starting to see some success with this program. Again, it's, it's very hard to, to quantify uh, uh, unless farmers come back and say, I'm getting better yields. Um, and, th and that's kind of the, the end result. But well, how much less water did you use? How much less fertilizer? Well, it varies from year to year and it depends on how much it rains and there's all these other variables that, that nobody can control very successfully. So it, it, it's difficult to quantify, but, but uh, there, there's surely a positive impact. And so that's what we're trying to create as best we can. Yeah, I think Bill and a couple others touched on um, the willingness of farmers to experiment experiment with new methods. Um, we talked about that a little bit yesterday. Um, another thing I want to ask about is knowledge transfer, but we also have an audience um, with questions, I hope. So we have Ivana and Sam uh, walking around with microphones. Just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll get to you. I think we have Mark up here. And this is a couple questions uh, for Bill. Uh, what do you see as the medium or long-term prospects for hog breeding to contribute significantly to further gains in feeding efficiencies and other uh, improvements such as uh, lean versus fat uh, in, in the near future? And second, would you be willing to comment on if and how the, the purchase of Smithfield by WH Group influenced corporate culture or, or, or operations? Thank you. All right. Um, I, I think in, in terms of genetics, uh, we uh, are a bit more sophisticated than farmers of old, I guess, but we, we breed for preferred genetics and continue to do that. And so you know, we breed for feed conversion. 
uh, for uh, quality of meat, lean versus fat. We actually um, kind of had an initiative. We wanted to create pork that was as lean as chicken, and we were able to do that. But um, uh, of course, that reduced the amount of, of fat and pork. If you're familiar, like with with gamey, like venison or venison, I mean, um, what happens is uh, without a lot of fat, you have to cook it very carefully, or it gets tough and chewy real quick. So we got feedback that said we really need a little bit more fat in your pork because at restaurants and food service, you know, they were ended up with pretty chewy pork. So, so we look to um, uh, to breed for that. Even the uh, the behavior of the animals, you know, uh, hogs are have a very strong so social order. Uh, but you've heard of boss hog. Well, that's based because in any group of hogs, one will be the dominant hog, and and will be mean to the other hogs at times. So we we don't want to breed these the these sort of stressed out, strained kind of of hogs. Um, like, like sometimes you see the little puppies that yap and yap and yap. They're just so bred out uh, that they're, they're difficult to deal with. So we, we, we try to breed and work for, for all those aspects. And of course, you change one thing in one area, you can change something in the other. And again, we have a huge number of hogs. So we have, we have genetic and breeding facilities where we do that. We don't do genetic modifications, uh, but we use breeding processes to, to, to be selective. Uh, and develop hogs with, with an overall sort of best impact and best value. Um, in terms of your, your second question, uh, yeah, we, we are owned Smithfield. It's been about three years. Uh, we were purchased by a company based in China called the, now called the WH Group. Um, and, and actually, I think uh, what they have turned out to be is one of our best customers. Um, uh, they have, of course, obviously provided us an opening into the, the Chinese market. Um, in China, the, the infrastructure, um, uh, a lot of issues don't really support them and the time it would take in developing their own herds, their own genetics. Um, uh, China actually imports corn. Uh, well, why would you import 2.4 pounds of corn when you can import one pound of pork? It's obviously more efficient uh, from a cost perspective to be able to do that. And you don't have to deal with the fact of roads and uh, reliable power sources and clean water and all the other things that are, uh, can be an issue in, in China. So what's happened for Smithfield is, is basically the company that owns this, like I said, is one of our best customers. They're like, send as much as you can to China because we can sell it there. You're a company that has a good reputation. We feel comfortable that the food is safe and of high quality. We know where it comes from uh, and how it's manufactured. So what that res has resulted is a kind of an overall higher demand for pork in the United States, uh, particularly from Smithfield, which is helpful to us, but kind of overall. Uh, so, so our factories now, instead of say operating at 70 or 80% capacity, are, are much closer to the 100% range. In fact, some of our plant managers probably say they're operating about 120% right now. But, but it, it's been very good for the company. It, it, it gives us a good market for our, uh, and profitable market for our product. Obviously, being owned by a Chinese company makes sort of the import, export process a little bit easier to deal with this for it. Uh, and so uh, what, what, what our owners, the Chinese uh, uh, executives have come back and said is, is continue to do what you're doing. In fact, do more of it because that helps us tremendously when we try to transfer and sell your product into the Chinese market. Um, kind of like uh, way back in the day, remember when like American blue jeans were all the rage, right? And you go to Russia and pay millions of rubles for a pair of jeans. Well, uh, you know, food from the United States is known pretty much for its quality and its safety. And so it actually even carries a premium in Chinese markets. So uh, it's been a real good synergy and benefited actually both companies, I think, really well. Uh, they, like I said, they have not come back and, and altered our processes. If anything, they've asked, uh, they're particularly focused right now, I think, on food safety. And so our food safety people have spent a lot of time in China uh, explaining how we keep our product safe and the things we do so that we don't have contamination and issues with the food product. So. Great. We have a question up here. Hi. Uh, yeah. This is for anybody who can answer it, I guess. Um, I was wondering if there's been any study, building on the feedstock question, um, if there's been any studies into like grass versus grain versus corn um, on the water footprint of the animals um, and whether the choice on the side of the producers is purely an economic one or if it, it 
deals with the water footprint or carbon footprint of any of those things. Thanks. So from a beef perspective, um, that's actually something that we're looking at at WWF is um, what are the trade-offs? Because there, there's definitely trade-offs. Um, you know, we, we are very focused on grasslands. And so immediately people think, oh, well, then it's grass-fed beef. Everything must revolve around grass-fed beef. Well, it's not that simple because um, grass-fed beef takes longer to um, come to market than grain-fed beef, where two years is typically uh, the lifespan of a grain-fed animal. A grass-fed animal is more like three years. And so during that time, they're using more water, they're burping more methane, you know, the, all of the things that go along. So it's a higher, higher carbon footprint, probably higher water use, potentially, um, because just for the fact that they're alive longer. So there's trade-offs to, to all of that. I think what we're looking at at WWF is, is where, where's the happy medium? And so is it longer on grass, less time in a feedlot, eating less grain? We think that that's kind of the optimum when it comes to, to beef production. Um, we're looking at some studies right now to try to figure out what that might look like from a beef perspective. There's, you know, the other piece is all about the organic production. You know, we hear a lot about organic production. Well, that's, you know, that's the way to go. Um, Maybe not. You know, once you start looking at those taking away some of the technology that is that goes into producing um, an, an organic product, you lose a lot of the efficiencies that are really, really important. In the U.S., um, even though we consume a lot of beef, we are also the most Im uh, we're the best at producing it. And so, um, when we look at globally the, the footprint of the U.S beef system, it's actually quite low compared to other countries because we're really good at what we do in producing beef in this country with the efficiencies that, um, that Bill talked about, very similar efficiencies on the, on the, um, the cattle side, not to mention all, all of the, the food byproducts that cattle eat. Um, one of the things that we look at in the, in the U.S. when we start looking at the Northern Great Plains as a grassland, one of the big um, obviously threats to that grassland is conversion to crop agriculture, which is kind of silly that, you know, then we turn around and we feed some of that crop agriculture to cattle that we're trying to preserve on the Northern Great Plains. And so it's this big, you know, we're, we're kind of fighting for it with ourselves in some of that. But there's also um, one of the big uh, pieces of, uh, that's causing a lot of that conversion is organic agriculture because uh, a lot of this grassland can fit right into organic wheat. Um, it hasn't been sprayed. It hasn't been, um, you know, nothing's touched it for, for the three-year time period that you're required to have organic production. So it's actually driving conversion rather than trying to um, prevent it from happening. So as I mentioned before, it's very complicated. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There's, there's not a solution that will just, you know, this is the silver bullet. We're going to do this, and it's going to, it's going to fix uh, all of our problems. It's definitely not that way. But we definitely think that working together as an industry, um, we're going to find kind of that optimum level of what, what makes the most sense from a beef production perspective. Jump in for a second there. You talked about um, maybe some misconceptions about, like, grass-fed beef organic. Um, and Eliza, you talked about how millennials, for example, um, have this consciousness. They want to um, be good to the earth with their purchases. Um, but I'm wondering, it seems like there's a little bit of a disconnect between what the consumer views as good and sustainable and what maybe the producers and the distributors know from experience is good from that side. So I'm wondering, um, I don't know if Ceres has looked into that at all, if there is, if Smithfield is dealing um, with that issue. Well, Ceres doesn't work as much with the consumer. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do think that the it, it's a very con confusing market for a consumer, because there are all of these different labels that say very different things. And when you look at them and start to ask questions, it's very unclear what they mean, even for somebody who's you know, working on these issues. Um, and so I think um, that makes it really confusing and frustrating. 
And I think the more the more clarity that we can bring to it from for the consumers, I think, is really important. I don't I don't have the the very clear answer for that. I know there are a lot, there's a lot of stuff popping up with like water quality treating um, and things like that where they want to start to do more labeling. But again, there are so many labels out there. Um, I think the key is just as a consumer trying to understand what companies you're buying from and what their practices are and. Um, you know, I went on a farm visit recently and someone was saying, a uh, farmer, and they, they do a lot of holistic raising, and he was like, well, really, you should just go to your farmer's market and, sorry, Bill, um, and ask your <laughs> farmer, does this chicken, does this chicken eat bugs? Like, that's the simplest question you can ask, and I really appreciated that, because I thought that was just like one simple thing you could do. Um, but I do think that, I think your question about the many different ways that everybody's looking at these issues is a real challenge. And a lot of the time we have conversations like this and there isn't a farmer in the room, right? Like there's no farmer here. And, but it's, it's more important when you have, you know, 300 people from industry in the room and then you have a panel like this and there's no farmer. And so I think making sure that everybody is engaged in this conversation and understands everybody else's perspectives uh, is a really important piece of the puzzle. And I think that's a lot of what the Roundtable and Sustainable Beef is doing. I think Smithfield's trying to do it by engaging with growers. But I think everybody needs to do a lot more of that uh, in order for us to really have an impact moving forward. And that's definitely the US Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is, is trying to do just that, where we're actually looking at you know, over, we have 110 members. Over half of those are producers. Um, they have a big role at the table. They're really kind of driving the boat um, in a lot of respects because we do need, if we're going to make change on the ground, it's the producers that are going to, going to make that change in a lot of respects. But also the five biggest packers are members. We have, you know, some very large beef producer or beef companies like McDonald's and Wendy's and Costco and Walmart. So we're talking about large companies that can really make an impact similar to what you're talking about with, you know, if, if a company like Costco, which is the largest buyer of beef globally, says, hey, rancher A, I would like you to raise products like this, that rancher is going to listen. They're, they can really make an impact. And so it's really important not only to have the producers at the table, but to have these companies at the table that can make an impact. Awesome. I want to jump to the question up here. Yep. Hi, my name is uh, Jess Moyer. I'm from Xylem's Advanced Technology and Innovation Team. Um, and today, all the panelists have talked about how in, in order for the meat industry to understand their water impact and their water risk data and information is key. Um, and I'm glad to hear that the, the willingness, the desire is there um, for farmers to, to monitor and understand their water impact. But on the other hand, um, Eliza, you said that many of the industries you've looked at have not performed a water risk assessment. And, um, but Bill, you said that you know, some crop farmers, they, um, they want to quantify their water use, but it can be complex because of the variation in, in rainfall, just as an example. So my question is, in your experience, have you seen that there are tools or technologies that are missing um, in order to enable this kind of, this awareness and information? Are there sensors or monitoring systems or software platforms um, or in general, you know, there, there may be some other water technology providers in the room. Um, can you tell us what can we do to help? Well, um, I'll, I'll take a shot. Anyway, I, I think um, uh, a lot of tech, like everything in every industry and every application, a lot of technologies exist. Uh, the cost to acquire them and utilize them typically becomes the issue, I think, that people try uh, to, to have to address. Uh, that's, that's one, I think, aspect of like the Smithfield Grow program that is very, very helpful. For instance, we have a drone um, and somebody who knows how to fly it. And so we can go to a farmer and fly over his fields and say, look, way back there where you can't see out in the middle, uh, you know, you're not getting as good a yield or growth because it's too wet or there's not enough nitrogen. Uh, you know, they, they, you can look at the whole field kind of, uh, rather than of course the farmer having to walk through row after row to figure out what, what, what's happening. So, um, uh, of course, uh, soil health and nitrogen levels and, and all those things can be, can be analyzed, but, um, it's sort of the, the, the cost and value to individual farmers, I think, is, is, is difficult. So I think 
uh, that, that programs uh, that, that are either sponsored sort of through collaboration or some kind of cooperative effort where everybody shares. Farmers have done that for a long time. Not every farmer owns every single piece of equipment that he needs to, uh, to raise and harvest his crops. Uh, they're leased, they're loaned, um, and, and shifted from location to location because the, the, the individual cost is too great for one farmer to bear. So I, I, I don't know that we, we lack technologies per se. Um, I, I think the, the application of them and probably the useful application of them is, is a real challenge uh, by being able to afford uh, to use them and to apply them in a way that's helpful. I think yeah. we're running, um, we're almost finished with our time here. Uh, I want to take two more questions. I think we have one here and one up here. If you guys could You could, do we have another question? Yeah, so if you guys could really quickly ask your questions, I'm gonna ask you to both um, ask them at once and then we'll try and tackle these two questions to wrap up our panel. At the same time. <laughs> so what I wanted someone to do is address for me systemically. What I'm hearing from this panel is feed, fertilizer, water, packaging, all kinds of efficiencies, all of the things that we care about, our, our footprint on this planet, it's really driven if we have consolidation. We seem to have in every sector by sector, we need three or four large companies and they're the ones who go out and drive it. So is that the future? Country by country, does the food sector across the board have to start looking as consolidated as it is here? And is that what developing countries have to have to get on board with? Um, <clears throat> my question <clears throat> was, I was kind, I am a farmer, so I actually, I'm like the less than 1% of people in the United States producing food. Um, I know where my food comes from, like my friends raise the chickens. Um, my friends end up having to slaughter their animals because we live in Maine and there's like two slaughterhouses in Maine. So my question was kind of going to be, what's the negative impact of consolidation? Because I see a lot of the negative impacts, which is lack of access to things like a slaughterhouse or those kinds of resources or just availability of food, like how many of you actually know a farmer or where your food comes from or the amount of acreage it requires for to um, grass raise a, a beef cattle, you know, like anyway. Great. No, I mean, I don't think I could have planned a better end to really <laughs> related questions. Um, so looking at potential for consolidating food systems in outside of the US, but also what are some of the negative aspects of that food consolidation. Um, we're supposed to break at 11.15, so I'm gonna ask each of you to keep your remarks I, super I, short. I can't answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a whole nother subject that I can't, but I can definitely, um, I, I too am a rancher. I grew up in the ran on a ranch in the Sandals of Nebraska, right in our eco region, which makes it really convenient for me to be able to work with ranchers. And in that part of the country, we have a lot of cattle, a lot of wide open space and not a lot of people. All of the people on the east and the west coast. And so the consumer sort of ends. So that consolidation piece is challenging in that if, if we're, we're talking about people that potentially, you know, in Montana, they don't have a slaughterhouse in Montana. And so all of their cattle have to go someplace, you know, in order for them to be able to, to use uh, the, the, the facilities. And so, is there a place in between where, where maybe it's not complete consolidation, but maybe it's through long-term contracts or some other sort of method where we can kind of help um, producers get their products to where they need to be, if that makes a lot, if that makes sense. I live in the famous agricultural region of Manhattan, so it's, uh, <laughs> unfortunately I don't have that perspective. But um, in terms of consolidation, I mean, that's one of the profound questions we're facing. And to perhaps compound it even more, one of the tensions from a policy perspective that I think about a lot is that on the one hand, agriculture is, is very local, right? And from a policy perspective, if you kind of want to implement 
policy effectively, you need to take into account context. There seems to be a word that's coming up again and again, but the different growing practices, climates, crops, cultures, generational shifts, right? On the other side of that spectrum, we all know that agriculture contributes to these global problems, climate change, biodiversity loss, right? Water, which is, yes, both a local but also a global problem. And so when I speak to um, the people that I've speaking, spoken to, say, in ministries of agriculture, they're all very much focused on the locals' perspective. Generally, at the international level, agriculture is left as a footnote because it's really tough and they want to focus, say, in the States on the 1,600 coal power plants instead of the 100 millions of acres of farmland. Um, it's not to say that there aren't these important initiatives going on, but there is this tension between wanting to deal with the, the local aspects and yet not ignoring the international dimensions. And that's the hard, one of the hardest nuts to crack. And nuts are really water intensive too, as we know. <laughs> I think like David mentioned, there's kind of a, a macro aspect and a micro aspect to, uh, to trying to be sustainable in terms of, of, of food production. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of people to feed. That's been mentioned several times and more and more. Uh, so do we, do we need to intensify agriculture, do more with less, um, so that we have these large quantities of food to be able to feed people? And of course, that calls for collaboration. Uh, sustainability is very broad, so you have, a, you have to bring together a large group probably so, yeah, you don't fix one problem, the whack-a-mole that was mentioned, um, you know, doesn't become the, the game of the day. Um, at the same time, then you lose the um, sort of the closeness to the process where people know where their food comes because they saw it. Uh, and they were part of it. Um, and, and that has a lot of value to people. And so that's important to be addressed. Uh, but so, and, and, and I think actually there's, there's probably room for both. There is now, and there will continue to be. So I don't think there's a, a right or wrong. Again, it's been mentioned many times, it's very complicated. There's a lot of impacts. Um, uh, one thing, the, a lot of interrelationships and interactivity that, that have to be addressed. But I think, uh, I think there's potential for both. So one does not rule because there's, there's a market of hungry people that want food. There's also a market of people who like to know where their food comes and how it's produced. And so I, I think both of those uh, processes can exist um, uh, and, and, and be useful and be effective for what they're intended to do. Yeah, I think, so lots of really interesting thoughts from everybody, and I, I think that um, consolidation is a really big challenge and something that you know, we've been thinking a lot about. It's not necessarily, we're not trying to change the systems, right? At Ceres, we're trying to, you know, we work with our folk, we're not just focused on organic, we're you know, engaged in conventional ag. Um, so I think I, I recognize that consolidation isn't going anywhere and it's gonna continue to happen, and I wouldn't be surprised if it does happen more overseas and you know, there are positives and negatives. And I think some of the positives are that when you have big companies that have consolidated and grown, they have a lot more money to adopt a lot of these technologies, right? And, and a lot of small dairy farms, for example, can't do what you know, other really big companies can do. Um, but then there are, of course, a lot of challenges because then you have you know, more animals in a confined space and more manure that could then leach into local waterways. So I think we're just gonna have to continue to grapple with these issues moving forward. I don't think there's one easy answer. Um, and, but I do think that there's a lot of potential then for small farmers um, in parts of the country to then appeal to consumers who don't like this trend of increasing consolidation um, and sell to you know, farmers markets and try to build local connections uh, to appeal to those different groups. Um, but I don't think we can just make consolidation go away. Um, but yeah, so those are just some, some thoughts there. Um, Great discussion. I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, <laughs>